is the Jeff Sato Show. Thirty-three minutes past the hour. It is the Jeff Santo Show that you are tuned into, coming to you live from the uh, South Coast uh, here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Folks, we're going to um, spend a little time uh, talking with our good friend Mark Taylor Canfield uh, today, and we're, we're going to be uh, doing quite a bit of analysis of how Seattle really is leading the country in so many ways, and a lot of it got to do with a democratic socialist. Miss Swan. Um, and we're going to continue this dialogue uh, not only today. We, normally, we talk to Mark at 5.30, but we needed to adjust uh, some schedules today. And we appreciate Mark uh, being flexible. Uh, but this uh, this is a great city, and I think it, it leads in so many ways. Uh, on the environmental side, on minimum wage, of course, SeaTac was the first place to go to 15 minimum wage. Of course, marijuana legalization, on and on and on. And that's why we're so lucky to have a great correspondent great part of the program. He was, uh, of course, the executive director of Democracy Watch News. Great musician. He's uh, the renaissance man of the Jeff Santos Show. MTC on the air an hour earlier. Happy Friday, MTC. Hey, GG. Uh, thank God it's Friday. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, but it's beautiful weather in Seattle, so I'm out on my kayak. It's the first time in a while. But there's no wind at all, so sorry. Live for the from the lake, huh? Or are you on the sound? Are you on the I lake or the sound? Uh, I am on the inland waters, which includes Lake Washington and Lake Union. They're connected through the Mott yeah. Lake Cut, which is this big canal that the Army Corps of Engineers created back in the early 1900s. And so, actually, there's a levee that you have to go through, uh, the locks, in order to get out to Elliott Bay and Puget Sound, the Salish Sea because Lake Washington is about 20 feet uh, higher than the sea level, so you kind of yeah. have to step your boat down in order to get in and out. But that's kind of a fun experience. If uh, anybody who's ever been to Seattle, it's so fun to visit the Ballard Locks and watch these really brave guys who have to wear harness and stuff because it's really dangerous work when you get these huge ships, you know, in those tight little um, yeah. lock systems. Yeah, yeah and sometimes you have to wait in line cool in the stuff. summer because a lot of people lined up trying to get out and enjoy the the day so but that turns into kind of a, a party a boat party anyway and you get to know other people on the boats so you know seattle apparently has more boats per capita than any other community in the country and um, with the lake union is actually right downtown so you can live on a lake and live in the middle of a major city which is kind of nice and then anytime yeah no doubt uh, about that like you want to grab it's... your kayak and run down to the lake you're there it's really nice Great well, let me ask you mark way. regardless so... of the Regardless of the skyrocketing rents, but that's another yeah, issue. Yeah. yeah, that's another issue we're going to get to as well. I want to I want to see if we can um, you know connect the dots to what we've been talking about you know uh, on the show today about what's happening in Ukraine and uh, in Russia and the uh, of course the connection uh, to what's going to be happening here. Uh, you know, most uh, analysts predict we're already seeding already. Uh, gas prices going up from three fifty four dollars a gallon. Some in places five dollars a gallon. And I'm wondering, you know, if if there are leaders, including your governor, Jay Inslee, who are talking about alternative ways. You know, I know that you were talking, we were talking earlier today, um, and we'll get into uh, the Seattle Pledge Arena in in a minute, but uh, where the uh, now new uh, Kraken hockey team plays. But, you know, he's uh, he ran his campaign for president uh, a couple of years ago on the environment. And I'm wondering if he would be what I've been saying over the last few days, asking the president to talk about whether it is uh, some kind of subsidies, tax credits, whatever, to get people to buy more electric cars, to get out off their cars, uh, out of their cars, I should say, and into uh, public transit, whether we're talking uh, rail, light rail, whether we're talking about, you know, inner city rail, however you want to do it. But, you know, obviously that we reduce the carbon footprint and it, it takes this whole political issue of people waiting in their cars for gas because you know, there is no gas or it's so ridiculously expensive and you go to your cheap gas place and that's been raised how much is he taking this issue and have you heard anything from him because as i said at the top seattle has sort of led the country in moving the agenda in a more progressive way yeah there is uh, some articles of, out about how the northwest has reacted to what's going on in current ukraine 
and what's happening across the country and internationally. So there's been a lot of uh, public officials from this state speaking out uh, against Putin and, and the invasion. And I think, you know, and there also have been uh, anti-war protests that have been happening, too. And I think that's happening all over the world, including in Russia. But uh, Jay Inslee really has been pushing a green economy for a long time. And so he would be a uh, perfect uh, match politically with AOC and Pramila Jayapal and, and our old friend Brad Friedman, who's still doing the Brad blog about, you know, environmental, or the Green Report about environmental issues around the world of KPFK and Pacifica Radio Network cohort with us. But it's, you know, Seattle is an interesting place, okay? First of all, uh, they, you know, the governor is right in tune with where, where Seattle policies are. They're actually trying to limit the, the amount of carbon-based traffic, and there's been a commitment by the city to go totally non-carbon uh, at some point. So uh, electric buses are a large part of how people get around in Seattle. Um, I'll give you some other examples. There are publicly uh, rentable motor scooters, electric motor scooters, electric bicycles, and other devices that you could just pick up with an app off your phone anywhere in town. And for a buck or two, you can ride, you know, through town. And it's much faster in some ways than trying to fight through the traffic. Because Seattle has terrible traffic. Rush hour here starts about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And until 7, you know, you're stuck, especially if you're trying to get across the bridge from uh, the east side of Lake Washington, because there's it's only the 420 or the 520 uh, bridge and the Lake Washington bridge to get across the lake. So it really funnels everything into these two major thoroughfares. So uh, there's always been an attempt to build a lot of bike trails. There are bike highways in Seattle, and I warn people, um, be careful because people do ride their bicycles about 20 miles an hour, and so don't get in their way. There's usually a lane that's specific for pedestrians as well. But they're literally um, pathways that have been built through the city, like the Burke-Gilman Trail is an example. You can actually follow urban trails. You can do urban hiking in Seattle where you can spend all of your day on these trails and, and bicycle lanes that will take you all over the city. And uh, they're dedicated to bicycles, electric scooters, uh, electric. There's all sorts of things going on here. There's electric skateboards. Um, I actually have a, hover car, a hoverboard, which I kind of like to use. It's just an easy way to get around in the city when you're in a hurry and you want to get downtown fast. There's always some kind of a lane somewhere nearby that are basically bicycle highways. So bicyclists get a lot of credits in the city. There's an attempt to keep people out of their cars, get them in mass transit. Uh, some proposals by the tenant or the uh, transit riders union has been, you know, free uh, transit at least in downtown, so that people don't even have to worry about having the right fare or using their, what we call the ORCA card here, which is our mass transit card. And then there's also sound transit, which is Puget Sound Transit. And it actually links local buses and trains all the way from Olympia, the state capital, up to like Bellingham, which is near the Canadian border. So, you know, that's about a four and a half hour uh, drive time. And it's all connected by commuter buses. And the commuter buses are really nice, Jeff. They're very roomy. They're better than a Greyhound, you know, Greyhounds are like, you know, you're a sardine in a can. But <laughs> these buses in Seattle are yeah, very well I've, designed. I've, I've, I've ridden the very Greyhounds. Not, not exactly a fun fun trip. Um, you know, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to get to you about some of the things that uh, have also been happening uh, that, you know, goes against the progressive uh, elements uh, of, of Seattle. And, and that is what is, uh, you know, you were testifying in front of uh, the Seattle City Council with uh, your good friend, and uh, we've, we've learned a lot about her on the show, thanks to you, uh, Ms. Sawant, uh, the city councilor. Uh, you know, her resolution was voted down 5-3 to three with one member being accent on the eviction issue. You know, again, you got high prices. We all know about uh, the invasion by Amazon workers and others, Amazon uh, not workers, but the people who have come in have paid the price that, you know, are ridiculous and raising all the prices for everybody else, you included, uh, in the city. So where is that? Because I know your mayor, who's not exactly, you know, on the same political philosophy as Sawan is, uh, you know, is, is uh, tied in with a lot of the uh, real estate folks there uh, in Seattle. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we were shocked to find out that two of the major individual contributors to 
our new mayor, Bruce Harrell's campaign, actually also gave quite a bit of money to Donald Trump. Uh, so they're actually kind of Republicans in disguise here who are hiding out, and they are behind the scenes. I keep laughing about how our nickname as a city is the Emerald City because it's so green and beautiful here. But the Emerald City is also the city in the Wizard of Oz where the great wizard lived. And so I keep telling people, now at least we know who two of the men are behind the curtain. And that's one of them is uh, a guy named Petrie. He's a CEO of a major real estate corporation here. So the real estate developers... Uh, are working with Amazon, Google. Um, I'm rowing right by in a major Google complex here in Seattle. They've moved a lot of their headquarters to Seattle. Um, and some of these buildings aren't even open yet. They're just so new that there aren't, there isn't even anybody working in them yet. But they're billion-dollar real estate development projects. So between Amazon, Google, Expedia, and other major corporations who have moved here recently and the ones who were already here, like Microsoft, Boeing, Starbucks, um, you know, there are billion dollars, billion dollar developments everywhere in downtown Seattle. Every square lot has been developed. Every square lot has a crane right now or a tower. And I'm looking at eight cranes right now just in my vicinity. And even, you know, during the pandemic, that all slowed down because the construction sites stopped. But now it's on full speed ahead. The rents are skyrocketing. There's no rent control in Washington state because of a law. Uh, that was passed by the state legislature, which makes it illegal for any individual city uh, to pass rent control, which is ridiculous and anti-democratic. Then you have uh, a mayor now who is siding with the business interests because they were the ones who spent so much money getting him elected. We could have had Lorena Gonzalez, who was our the president of the city council, very, very progressive. But instead, we have Mr. Business Interest, Bruce Harrell. And that often happens in Seattle, where the city council is actually representing the very progressive and left-leaning and, you know, uh, uh, bohemian neighborhoods like Capitol Hill. So they have representatives like Democratic Socialist Shama Swant from the Socialist Alternative Party. She works a lot with progressive Democrats, though, to get legislation through. So now you have, once again, as we had with Mayor Jenny Durkin, the former uh, U.S. attorney with the Obama administration, she ended up being the conservative... uh, uh, business interest uh, supporting can you know a uh, mayor as opposed to the activist candidate that she ran as a progressive activist, and now we're getting the same thing. Only this time it's even a little bit more uh, upfront. You know they're not necessarily trying to fool us again like the Who song says, but they're actually just they just ran a guy, and you know and he has crit in the community because he's been here so long. He was president of the city council before and also interim. Uh, mayor for a while, so he has the the ability to lead. There's no doubt in that. Nobody questions that. He's also got an interesting background because he's half black and half Japanese. His mother, her mother's family, was in. Yeah, you know what, what happens with that. If I can, Mark, interject here, and I, I just uh, you know uh, before we came on the air, read a little bit about you know that he's proud of the money. Uh, that has been generated from uh, the Asian American Pacific Islander community as well as the as the African American community. You know, at the same time, you know, just because these groups, which is great that they give money, it doesn't mean that you're you're going away you're going away from the system that Swan and others have built. You know, of a campaign finance system. And again, this throws in the idea not only of identity politics, but you know, just because you're you're a minority, you know, we use the extreme example on the show of Clarence Thomas. I mean. Clarence Thomas is a black man, and obviously he had experiences as a youth that is important. But Clarence Thomas has been on the Supreme Court since 1991, I believe, and has been a disaster for the country. And, you know, I'm not saying that Harold is the exact same replica of Clarence Thomas, but we, we can't have that. And if he's taking money from the same donors that are giving money to Trump, you got to wonder, you know, where things uh, are going. And that's, that, to me, is a, a huge piece of, of, of the puzzle. Yeah, it's an eternal battle here between the corporate interests and the progressives. And here it's not necessarily Republicans versus Democrats because the Republicans don't have any direct, except right. they elected a city attorney, Ann Davison, which is kind of scary because, you know, if there are any protests, we know that she's going to try to prosecute everybody that gets arrested to the full extent of the law. But, you know, we also have Bruce talking about dismantling a lot of homeless encampments while. They, he just called for the end of the rental eviction moratorium, which, of course, the real estate companies have been all up in arms about and saying, 
you know, socialism, and, you know, we have to stop this. We need laissez-faire, laissez-faire capitalism in Seattle in order for the city to thrive. But in reality, a lot of the relief programs, what some might call you know, socialism, actually helps people out of poverty, kept them from being kicked out in the streets. Currently, there are 100,000 people who are behind in their rent in Seattle that have already tried to file for some kind of rental assistance. The city council still has $25 million dollars for rental assistance that hasn't been spent yet um, through these emergency measures during the pandemic. And why is it being held um, up? Yet, because of the other the other Sarah Nelson and others voting uh, absent on all this? Uh, well, many reasons. There were so many things going on during this pandemic. There was such an economic disaster happening in Seattle. So many people were unemployed. So many businesses closed and went out of business that the council just had its hands full every single meeting with an emergency session. So, and it, some of it is just bureaucracy, Jeff. You know how it works, you know. Oh, it's yeah. It's a great idea, and then once it gets turned over to the bureaucracy, there's a battle over the funds and where they're going to go, and it takes forever. So, right now, I just, you know, this is part of my public testimony, is you need to spend that $25 million today. And I know my um, city council representative, Andrew Lewis, who is Robert Reich's protege, he would agree with me that, if no, it's time to spend that money, there's no time to mess around. If you're going to stop the eviction moratorium and people are going to be evicted, right now is the time you need to be helping them with these relief payments. And none of these moratoriums actually ever stopped people from owing rent. It didn't forgive their rents. It just kept them from being evicted and gave them more time to pay it back. So according to the way the laws are written, all of these tenants still have to pay all of that back rent that they were unable to pay during the pandemic. So in the meantime, Martin Luther King Jr. County, the state, and the city came up with some funding to try to help people so that they could catch up on these rental bills. And I know people who had really good jobs before the pandemic and suddenly were flat, you know, without any employment or income. And they were helped by a lot of those uh, rental relief efforts that kept them from being evicted from their place that they lived in for 10, 15 years. Also, small businesses received some subsidies that kept them alive, some of them being music clubs that we all love here. So we've seen how government funding and the taxpayers getting together and saying, hey, let's, you know, let's stimulate the economy, how it can be very effective. Right now, I'm just worried that we're going through a period where they're going to, even though the city council is still meeting remotely, apparently because of the pandemic, now they're voting against continuing the relief programs. And that seems kind of ironic to me. And that was something that I wrote in an op-ed I just submitted to the Seattle Times, you know, is that this irony of, well, they're going to meet remotely, but they're going to try to pretend like everything's back to normal again. And I'm sorry, it's not. Well, that's that's indeed the case. And, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of articles out by Economic Policy Institute folks of, uh, you know, this recovery, you know, and and how it's uh, helping the one percent and so forth. And a lot of people, but a lot of African-American women, people of color, uh, women who are not uh, uh, gaining a job, not gaining an increase in in in, uh, in their wages and so forth. So there's a lot there. Hey, I know you went to the uh, Bruins uh, Kraken game last night at the Pledge Arena. Oh, my. Um, and I know that that, uh, you know, great uh, great event and Bruins won. That's the good thing. Only kidding, of course. Uh, they did win, <laughs> but uh, I know that uh, you wanted <laughs> Seattle to win. Um, that being uh, said, um, you know, you play at, a, at, a, at an arena, the only arena that I know in professional sports in North America that is focused on the, on the climate pledge. How did that come about, and, you know, how important is it? Because the NHL Players Association, and years ago we had on Andrew Ferentz, a former NHL hockey player who was a massive uh, uh, advocate for going green. And, you know, they were trying to green uh, the buildings that the NHL were playing in and so forth. Not sure exactly what happened, but this is the first arena that I know of that, you know, that calls itself you know, in connection with uh, climate change, climate pledge. Give us a little uh, history on that. Well, Mayor Jenny Durkin was a big hockey fan. So one of the first things that she wanted to do, um, instead of bringing an NBA basketball team to Seattle, she wanted to bring hockey. So she dedicated herself to making sure that the funds were available to renovate the key arena. Where I've seen, you know, some great music concerts like, Peter Gabriel and just amazing stuff like that. But, you know, it also needed some some renovation. It had been around since the World's Fair in the early 1960s when we got the Space Needle, which I can see right now is one of the coolest buildings in the world. 
Jeff. I can't help but think I've, I've lived here for years and I still think it is. But anyway, but, you know, having, first of all, having the Bruins in town was quite a treat because it's the first time that Boston has actually come, came to Seattle for hockey. And so there were, some, there were some Bruins jerseys in the crowd. There were people who were having a great time. And we all got really excited about the women and men's hockey teams during the Olympics. And we're a little bit disappointed in some ways, although, you know, hey, credit to the women for getting a silver, right? So it's not yeah. bad. But The whole thing was, was screwed up because of what happened with the China, uh, with uh, the pandemic and so forth. But go ahead. But, yeah, so in Seattle, we have a new arena. Um, even during the pandemic and, you know, the slowdown in construction and the stop work stoppage for a while there, they were able to meet their timeline and bring the Kraken to Seattle. And with some good uh, trading deals and some help from the league, they were able to come up with a pretty decent team. And so it was really exciting having the Bruins here because I told you earlier they're kind of like the Green Bay Packers of the NHL. They've been around forever and have such an amazing, you know, impressive history with, you know, players like Bobby Orr and, you know, have and also had recruited the first black player in the NHL. Yeah, Willie O'Ree. Uh, yep. What, back yeah, back, back in, in the late 1950s, so yeah. They made a big deal about that because it is Black History Month, so they wanted to make a, make it a celebratory moment. So they talked a lot about um, what the Bruins did during this game. That was a part of the, the celebration of Black History Month. And I'm impressed because... Um, and my city council member, Andrew Lewis, just gave a report on Wednesday about this. They really have met some of the goals that people were thinking were a little bit outrageous, like a zero carbon footprint for that building. Now, how do you do that? Well, it has thousands of plants inside the building, which are creating a situation where the CO2 can be absorbed, right? So there you go. And then also, it's connected to the monorail system, which comes right into the Museum of Pop Culture, another great place in Seattle. It used to be called the Experience Music Project because it was basically Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft and the owner of the Seahawks. He built a museum there to house a lot of his Jimi Hendrix memorabilia because he had a lot of Jimi's old guitars and you know clothes and cool stuff that he had collected. So he started a museum, and that's where the, the monorail goes to from downtown. So a lot of folks... They stay in the hotels downtown. They leave their cars there. They get on the monorail, which is electric, so it doesn't have a carbon footprint. And it takes them straight to the Seattle Center so they can see the hockey game. And then within 10 minutes, they're back downtown at their hotel. So it works out really well. A lot That's of people a great, walk, great too, because it's so close. It's kind of fun to be out on the street showing your colors, you know, and saying hi to everybody and maybe, you know, you know stopping in at a few pubs along the way. So there's also kind of a street scene associated with that where people don't, aren't necessarily driving so and once again the city kind of discourages cars and i know that really freaks people out who are from uh you know nevada or somewhere where you know there are long yeah, the car calls to southern california for that matter, sure yeah no it's, it's yeah. it has to be changed hey i want to uh, i want to bring in another city that i think that could potentially do this is minneapolis st paul of course with the wild play uh and uh, let's uh, talk to our good friend john in minneapolis uh before you have to uh, run there uh, John, you're next with uh, MTC uh, here on the program. Go right ahead, John. Hey, John, yeah. what's up in Minneapolis? Uh, I consider Minneapolis sort of yeah. a sister city to Seattle. So, Well, I, I think it is in, in many ways. You know, uh, it, when they put the train through, you know, in the, in the late 19th century, a lot of people, uh, after about a winter or two here in Minnesota, thought, wow, this really sucks. Let's let's move on <laughs> all the way to the west coast, where at least they don't have to deal with the snow, and you can fell the trees, and the rest is history. But there is really a a pretty deep connection between, you know, this used to be be the gateway of the northwest, as uh, <coughs> James Hill used to say. Yeah. I have cousins yeah. who live there, and also um, my family. I was telling Jeff earlier today. During the Depression, at least one half of my family moved because of the loss of the jobs in the factories and the mines, right? So they moved from Kentucky mm -hmm. to um, Minnesota and then Michigan. So my mother actually grew up in Michigan ice skating, which is why she's always been a huge figure skating fan and likes hockey, you know, which is kind of rare for yeah. Seattle until recently. But, yes, yeah, 
Minneapolis was a place where people and, and Michigan was a place where the snow was too deep, so they came west. That's exactly why. There you go. Out here. <laughs> right. uh, John, thank you for the call, my friend. We'll talk later. Uh, Mark, always great uh, chatting with you. Uh, a great uh, lesson in what's happening in Seattle today. All the best uh, fighting the good fight on uh, rent control and uh, issues that, uh, you know, help people as opposed to, you know, keeping them on the hey, streets. Hey, Jeff, you have a great show. We're putting, I'm putting a bunch of videos up on YouTube right now so folks can check me out there. So have a good one. Keep rocking. All the best, Mark. Uh, we will. We'll be right back with Joe Sandberg. It's the Jeff Santo Show. Back in a flash.